Welcome. I am recording this video to show you my presentation that I presented at the Hack Summit, which is the largest conference on cybersecurity in Poland, for the first time publicly on 20th of October 2023 on National Stadium in Warsaw. The topic of the lecture was Deep Packet Inspection Analysis, why the typical approach is not enough. My name is Michał Sołtysik, I am a cybersecurity consultant specialized in deep packet inspection, network edge, profiling and zero day attacks. The description of the lecture was there is an unquestionable need to perform regular deep packet inspection analysis that is network edge profiling, providing standard SOC type services that use tools such as SIM, SOAR, IPS, WAF, EDR and others leads to the partial waste of human resources due to the constant dealing with the so-called false positives. The cybersecurity industry is currently characterized by superficiality, insufficient competence and low cyber awareness. Cyber criminals are in possession of hundreds of mechanisms that they regularly take advantage of to break through firewalls. In this lecture I will present an advanced view of the realities that teams such as SOC are unable to deal with and explain why this is the case. I will use extensive knowledge of a variety of threats based on analysis of 252 different network protocols from the areas of IT, OT and IoT. Touching on cybersecurity, I am certified in Certified Cybersecurity Analyst, Certified Network Forensic Examiner, Certified Digital Forensic Examiner, Wireshark Certified Network Analyst, Certified Professional Ethical Hacker, Certified Vulnerability Assessor. You can contact me via email at microwavepoland at gmail.com or LinkedIn, just type in Michal Soltisic. In order to assess certain SOC team's maturity and operations, you can ask the following questions to find out. Question number one. How do we monitor network traffic? The answer is events in SIM, flows in SIM, IDS, IPS alerts, WAF alerts and others. Question number two. What do we pay attention to? The answer is known vulnerabilities vulnerable systems, anomalies, policies on the firewall, and censura. Question number three, how do you deal with the so-called false positives? The answer is, well, here is often the problem. We are constantly trying to tune the systems. Question number four, is it enough that we try to tune systems? The answer is, well, rather not, but it is what it is. Question number five, how do we do, I mean, what do we do with monitoring commonly known mechanisms? For example, ICMP, DNS, MySQL, FTP, and Centura. The answer is, well, this is a difficult topic. After all, this is ubiquitous traffic. Question number six. What about encrypted traffic? For example, SSH or TLS? The answer is hard to say because it is encrypted traffic. Question number seven. What do we do? with monitoring unknown to most systems and SOC teams mechanisms? The answer is, I don't know. Question number eight, what do we do about zero-day attacks? How do we counter them? The answer is, well, this is uh, always, uh, always uh, a problem. Are we helpless? Question number nine, can we estimate the risk adequately? The answer is, we try to. Question number 10. Well, what now? The answer is understand network traffic mechanisms, protocols, operations, deep packet inspection through profiling of edge interfaces will help you understand what is really going on in your infrastructure and show you how someone is trying to obtain important information in various ways, get inside the local network and exploit systems. 
Awareness is the key to guaranteeing the network security of your infrastructures. Without it, you will simply be partially blind and consequently doomed to failure. So far, I have identified 252 protocols within the areas of IT, OT, and IoT used for cyber attacks. This is the list of all these protocols. A big part of them, though, unfortunately, is unknown to a substantial majority of cybersecurity experts in the game. Some advanced cyber criminals keep taking advantage of them, though. Since it would be impossible to present this uh, lecture based on all these mechanisms within an hour or so, I am going to discuss the lecture topic based on the following eight examples. Finally, I am going to give 20 simple tips how to be a proficient network traffic analyst performing deep packet inspections. Example number one. Based on different level monitoring of HTTP traffic through SIEM system versus DPI analysis on the example of remote code execution that is actually an user account creation vulnerability. I chose one vulnerability. WordPress plugin download manager version 2.7.4 remote code execution. This remote code execution vulnerability actually leads to the unauthorized user account creation. You can find it exploit database. This is what an HTTP packet looks like for this vulnerability. As you can see on the right hand side, only within the content type you can see some malicious indicators and content. All the HTTP headers look standard and non-malicious. Monitoring such an attack via a SIEM solution, Qradar in this case, is very difficult then. As for events, you can only see an event name, transport protocol and destination port used. There is no content type column available. As for flows, you can actually see such a column available. However, you can only see the name of a content type, not all its content. In order to see all the content, you have to look at the payload. It is common knowledge that correlation rules used for monitoring in Curator should not use the payload contains filter as this would crash the console. Alternatively, you can obtain logs from access that log from the server via syslog. However, such logs do not contain all the information needed. Monitoring HTTP traffic still provides a lot of options. However, such a situation is not the case for most protocols. For example, TLS, you have very few columns for events. You have a few more for flows, but still not enough to be able to monitor all the threats. The situation gets much worse for some other common protocols such as SMB. No columns indicating certain headers are available. Same with some uncommon protocols such as Edwin that we'll discuss to a greater extent later on. Example number two. Based on file upload, remote code execution vulnerability and HTTP traffic. I chose the Tongda Office and where unauthorized file upload vulnerability uh, the vulnerability is due to insufficient sanitizing of user supplied inputs when handling and crafted requests. It allows a remote attacker to upload an arbitrary file onto a vulnerable system via a crafted request. The problem though lies in how a Fortinet IPS system detects this threat. 
IPS is unable to differentiate between false positives, true positives, or benign true positives. It is not capable of assessing risk accurately. As we know, cybersecurity goes hand in hand with risk. Let's now discuss a few different packets that all triggered off the very same IPS alert that is this vulnerability. The first packet on the left hand side looks normal. It could be generated once someone just wanted to access upload.php. The second packet has an encoded content of the GET request. Even though such a packet is not going to exploit this vulnerability, the situation we are dealing with now is very suspicious and consequently the risk is uh, higher. The third packet on the right hand side though does not look normal. It is a crafted TCP packet exploiting this vulnerability. As a result, the risk will be the highest. As you can see, both the second and third packets were generated by public IP addresses with an unknown reputation. The fourth packet looks like a, the first one. It's absolutely okay. That was not sent, I mean, it was sent from a malicious IP address hosted in Korea. The risk will be slightly different here. Also, such a packet could be sent from a legitimate Polish public IP address and it would be 100% false positive. Example number three. Based on TCP, FTP, DNS, PN, IO, ICMP, RTCP, UDP, ICP, NPNS, and SNMP traffic. Basic supported comments for FTP can be found in RFC 959. For FTP there is a 500 response code which may be sent in response to any comment that the server is unable to recognize. It is a permanent negative response which means the client is discouraged from sending the comment again since the server will respond with the same reply code. It usually means that the client has sent a comment to the server that the server does not recognize. The simple functionality is all a hacker will need for a certain scenario I will discuss in a minute. There are also some other comments supported for FTP implemented in some extensions. This is the full list of FTP comments that uh, may be sent to a FTP server. You can find it at Wikipedia. This packet shows the use of the simple FTP functionality to potentially control a DOS attack. As you can see, the request comment is mglndd underscore IP address underscore destination port. It is not a supported comment. What is it then? I will explain in a second. Such a payload can be also sent via a DNS packet. Getting back to the point, MGLNDD string indicates the use of Magellan, which is a common line interface for a tool called Ripe Atlas. This tool can be also used via a web interface, but that way it will leave a different payload. Anyway, such packets are being generated and sent from many different public IP addresses that are associated with the stretchoid opt-out scanners. Such scanners can send this payload using many different protocols. For example, Profinet, which is an industry technical standard for data communication over industrial Ethernet. This payload though might differ. I have found three different payloads that all include the MGLNDD string. Before discussing this topic publicly during the conference, there was at that very point 
no information available publicly regarding what this payload and stream were all about. You could have only found a post on Sun's forum from Dieter Stevens asking the whole community if anybody knew anything about this payload. You could have only found answers that actually did not give any valid information. The answer to this mystery is presented on the next slide. This string indicates two measurement attempts. One is hub count measurement in wide computer networking, including the internet. A hub occurs when a packet is passed from one network segment to the next. The number of hubs refers to the number of devices, usually routers, through which a piece of data passes. The hub count is the total number of hubs that a data packet travels through. Two is RTT measurement. Round trip time, in short, RTT or RTT, is the minimum time required to transmit a signal in both directions from the sender to the receiver and then in the other direction after which we can receive an acknowledgement of receipt of the message. RTT directly affects throughput. ICMP can be also used by this tool. This packet though indicates a web interface being used. The payload is different. ICMP echo request is an ICMP protocol message that contains a packet of data to the host and a request to send it back as an ICMP echo reply. The host must respond to each echo being request with an ICMP echo reply message containing exactly the same data as the received ICMP echo request packet. ICMP echo request is used for network diagnostics, although it can be also used for attacks such as DOS or FLAT. In this packet we can see the very same payload, but this time it's been sent over RTCP protocol. RTCP is a control protocol that supports RTP, which is a real-time transmission protocol precisely for transporting real-time data such as audio or video. It allows monitoring of data delivery and provides limited control and identification functions. It should come as no surprise then that this protocol is used to calculate RTT values since one of its four basic functionalities is to provide feedback regarding the correctness of received data. Although, in fact, um, here we have two attack vectors in just one packet, but I will talk about this later on slide number 62. On this slide we can see how using this RIPE ATLAS tool looks both for the web and common line interfaces. Based on RTT measurements we can control a DOS attack by comparing RTT values. Let's use this knowledge in a real life scenario. On this slide we can see five different payloads indicating five different DOS attacks. Let's use the first one for the simulation of the attack. It's called Flood of Death or Ping of Death. Once a certain service is under such an attack, in a SIM solution you can only see UDP traffic on destination port 6500. It's not much information. The packets will tell us much more. As we can see on this slide, many different tunneling and encapsulating protocols were used to send this payload. Now the question is what for? Regardless uh, the type of protocols used and the purpose for which tunneling is to be used, its basic technique remains the same. Typically one protocol is used to establish a connection to a remote site and another protocol is used to wrap data and instructions for transmission through the tunnel. Tunneling is a method used to transfer a payload or frame or a packet of one protocol using an internet work infrastructure of another protocol because the transmitted payload belongs 
to a different protocol, it cannot be sent as it is created. Encapsulation is a process of encapsulating the payload with an additional header so that it can be sent tunneled through the intermediate network correctly. After the transmission, the encapsulated payload needs to be de-encapsulated at the routing endpoint and can be forwarded to the final destination. The whole process of encapsulating, transmitting, and later de-encapsulating is called tunneling. However, tunneling is sometimes known as encapsulation as well, which leads to confusion. Anyway, all of these protocols are using DOS attacks to add processing overhead, that is the overall cost of processing to IP defragmentation in order to affect the target. On this slide we are dealing with a very interesting protocol. ICP is a UDP-based protocol used for coordinating web caches. The function of ICP is to use the caches as efficiently as possible and to minimize, minimize the number of remote requests to the originating server. As you can see, a certain payload can be sent using this mechanism. The communication will be bidirectional. With every single packet, will additionally receive a certain RTT value. We can then control a DOS attack with every single send and received packet. For this reason, I call this 2-in-1. On this slide, we can see the use of the RTT mechanism in practice during a DOS attack. The attack began with sending an ICMP echo pin request and the echo pin reply was received. This helped to estimate the RTT baseline. Then several DOS attacks were initiated. As we can see, the first packet was sent at 10.41. Two minutes later, at 10.43, an ICP packet was sent to check how much more a server is being overloaded. Example number 4. Based on RTT measurements during DOS, DDoS cyber attacks. Let's choose a certain web page that we'll use to simulate a DOS attack against. We cannot use a page for the RIPE ATLAS tool as ICMP responses are disabled. Same with the page for the Hack Summit conference. Well done. However, the conference official organizer's page responds to ICMP echo pin requests. So let's choose this one. Let's imagine that there is an attacker somewhere out there in China. He is about to conduct a DOS attack on our web server. Let's choose TLS as a protocol for this attack. Of course, it doesn't have to be TLS. It could be SSL, DTLS, WTLS, or QUIC for application DOS attacks. For example, TCP, UDP, or ICMP could be used for volumetric DOS attacks. Certain conditions need to be fulfilled so that this TLS traffic can reach the target. Since in most cases a web page should be available for the whole internet via TLS, nothing, routing tables and firewall security policies should not be a problem. Anyway, let's see what happens here. The hacker generates some TLS traffic that affects the web server. Now how to control the attack? The answer is on this slide. Before discussing this topic publicly during the conference, this information was not available publicly. Anyway, there are four general ways how to control this TLS DOS attack. Either via ICMP echo pin request, UDP used as a transport protocol with a lot of various application protocols on top to any destination port. One solution that uses TCP or UDP on destination port 33434 or ICP over UDP on destination port 3130. This slide shows how many different methods can be used and also how many different traces can be found in the packets. All these ways are for malicious intent. 
However, some protocols use very legitimate RTT-owned computation mechanisms to control the quality of a connection. Some examples are RTCP, RTT, and IAX2. On this slide, we can see such packets that utilize their own RTT calculation mechanisms. However, not every single time this mechanism will be used by a Serbian criminal. The pack on the left hand side has zero value for the timestamp header. This packet then will not be used to calculate RTT values. This packet was generated to fulfill other purposes. They could be referred to as 1. Call initiation attempt to potentially exchange media messages through firewalls. 2. Monitoring reachability of a remote peer so testing connectivity of a, uh, connectivity of a remote IAX peer. 3. Maintaining awareness of the state of the user to a remote peer. The packet on the right hand side has 22616 value within the timestamp header. The RTT mechanism was used then. What is more, the IAX payload value indicates flood of death. This packet reflects 2 in 1. Both the DOS attack and the RTT measurement based on calculating inter arrival delays to control that DOS attack. Even well-known protocols such as TCP and HTTP can be used for this purpose. You can just compare the RTT differences between the time between the SYN and SYN ACK and the delay between the server's ACK and the actual data packet. The first value will indicate the current uh, route trip time. The delay will indicate server overload. Example number 5. Based on Modbus over TCP, WTP, H.225.0, RAS, GTP, RTCP, and PFCP traffic. TOS attacks do not have to involve flooding targets with a huge number of packets. Sometimes it can just take one packet to cause a DOS state. Such attacks will be based on taking advantage of a certain operation within the scope of operations for a certain protocol. On this slide we can see four examples of such packets. We do not have enough time to discuss them in detail. On the next slide we can see three more. We'll discuss the one in the middle and also the one on the right hand side. The one in the middle is the one I previously said I would get back to. Anyway, the by packet indicates that one or more sources are no longer active. If a by packet is received by a mixer, the mixer forwards the by packet with the SSRC CSRC identifiers unchanged. If a mixer shutdowns, it should send a by packet listing all contributing sources it handles, as well as its own SSRC identifier. Optionally, the by packet may include an 8-bit octet count, followed by that many octets of text indicating the reason for leaving. For example, camera malfunction or RTP loop detected. As a result, entries may be deleted from the table when an RTCP by packet with a corresponding SSRC identifier is received. The one on the right hand side is PFCP. It indicates an unauthorized transmission of PFCP session deletion request targeting a specific PDU session. This results in the severing of the established GTPU tunnel. An authorized request to delete a PF PFCP session can be easily sent, for example, using the copy packet capturing tool, crafting tool. 
Usually such a packet is properly formatted and contains all the required parameters and metrics for successful deletion of a GTPU tunnel. Simply put, such a packet is capable of interrupting the communication processes. A particularly dangerous enhancement of this attack is its fusion with a variant of the PFCP flood attack. Assuming that a malicious user has gained access to the SMF-NF and wishes to interrupt the connection of UEs without targeting a particular subscriber, they can run a session deletion attack numerous times with incrementally increasing SEIDs as no other identifier is requested by PFCP for the deletion of a session by UPF and malicious SMF can instantiate a flood of session deletion requests carrying either random or increasing SEIDs. This allows the easy automation of attacks as only a single identifier is required for the control of subscriber sessions. Example number 6. Based on GTP, TIPC and CG traffic. Let's now discuss three very interesting packets. Even though a lot of information on these three protocols are available publicly, such clear conclusions were not publicly available before discussing this topic publicly during the conference. Focusing on this packet, GTP is a group of IP-based communications protocols used to carry general packet radio service, GPRS, within GSM, UMTS, LT, and 5G NR radio networks. GTPU is used for carrying user data within the GPRL, GPRS core network and between the radio access network and core network, while IP packets are not transmitted directly but are tunneled encapsulated using this protocol. We can see a redirection request here. The first aim is to advise that received CDR traffic is to be redirected to another CGF due to the sending CGF node is allegedly about to stop service due to an outage for maintenance or an error condition. The second aim is to inform a CGF which is currently sending data to this node, for example CGF, that the next node in the chain, for example a mediator device or a billing computer, has allegedly lost connection to this node, for example CGF. What is more, we can obtain vendor or specific uh, or operator specific information due to the optional private extension. In this situation we are dealing with two or even three attack vectors simultaneously. Denial of service, man in the middle and also potentially information disclosure. TIPC is an inter-process communication IPC service in Linux designed for cluster-wide operation. The TIPC protocol is available as a module in the mainstream Linux kernel and hence in most Linux distributions. The TIPC project also provides open source implementations of the protocol for other operating systems. We can see here a routing table update attempt by informing about the existence of all system nodes within cluster and providing a network address to which node the sender node should establish direct contact over TIPC protocol using local routing table message type because for non-malicious traffic the address value should remain undefined because usually the receiving nodes already know which cluster they belong to. SIGI, Common Image Generator Interface, is a wire protocol for communication between an IG, VAS image generator, and a host application such as a cockpit or other host application. 
This protocol is widely used in the simulation industry. Traffic from these two IP addresses hosted in China indicates the following purposes. First, forcing the image generator to accept all types of data packets destined for it, return all types of data packets suitable for real-time operations and report errors to the host via the image generator code status parameter of the data packet. The second purpose is to change, that is update the position of the 3D model in the simulation environment. Third, the attacker receives information about the range, line of sight and height above terrain of the existing model. As in this case, it is sometimes difficult to determine the attack vector because we are dealing with a rather specific mechanism. However, the key here is to understand the intentions of the cyber criminal, and we managed to do so. Example number seven. Based on Edwin and Batman gateway traffic. Let's now discuss two uncommon attacks. There is very little and general information on these two protocols in the internet today. No detailed information can be found. Anyway, some time ago I came across Edwin packets from some public IP addresses hosted in China and Indonesia. I had not seen them before and they had drawn my attention. The packets have some unusual headers and values. They could not have been understood. I searched for any information on the internet to help me understand these packets. I could not have found anything of real value apart from some general information. The semantic fetch write communication via Ethernet network is a point-to-point -point connection between an Edwin system and a semantic PLC. The connection enables write and read only access to the system memory of the semantic PLC. Access is available to data modules, flux, inputs, outputs, counters and timers. The Edwin configuration protocol is used to discover, configure and update Edwin devices with Ethernet connections. Since the Edwin devices are completely headless, all configuration options must be set remotely. When I searched for some standard Edwin traffic and found packets that did not have too much in common with the packets I found earlier. Next, I contacted the company and spoke to the creator of this protocol. Mr. Thomas provided me with some information that helped me understand the attack. I was also given some examples, uh, I mean samples, of standard Edwin traffic that look similar to the packets I found. After thinking everything over, I came to the following conclusions. We are dealing with the Semantic PLC remote mapped command execution attempt over Edwin communication protocol. Mapping depends on 1. The last command being sent in the request. 2. The type of CPU installed in the Edwin system. 3. The user application running inside that CPU and some more parameters. This mapped command is clearly obfuscated. Even the creator of the mechanism is not able to bring the mapped command into another kind of readable format. Next, I found this Batman gateway packet with only two headers. The information I could have found in the internet was too general. For instance, that I could have found out about the following. The tunneling method between the Batman Internet Gateway client and the Internet Gateway provides a stable route to the Internet. Batman can run on top of a variety of mesh implementations, including 802.11s, ad hoc IBSS, 
and multiple point-to-point -point links, wired or wireless and also stationary systems. Next, I contacted the owners of a mechanism, the creators of a mechanism. Mr. Simon provided me with some internal documentations that helped me understand the attack. We can see here refreshing list IP, the IP list by the client over Batman Gateway protocol using Keep Alive request type. In the packet we can also see the indicated assigned IP address to be list assigned. Therefore, in this case, it is not enough just to block a single source IP address host in Pakistan. We should also block the second one seen in the packet. According to the mechanism's creator, the Batman Gateway protocol is a very old, so now absolute, protocol for tunneling data, encapsulating IP messages, and is used in Batman mesh networks on layer 3 of the OSI model, that is a local area networks where infrastructure nodes, that is bridges, switches, and other infrastructure devices connect directly, dynamically, and non hierarchically to as many other nodes as possible and work together for efficient routing. Cyber criminals use such outdated protocols quite often. On this slide we can see that no detailed information on this protocol can be found in the internet today. Regarding the request type in question, we can only find a plugin for Wireshark's dissector. Example number 8. Based on remote code execution vulnerability and manolita and ether CIT traffic. Let's talk about this Realtek Jungle SDK command injection vulnerability. Successful exploitation of this vulnerability allows a remote attacker to execute arbitrary code on vulnerable devices leading to system compromise. Realtek Jungle SDK based IoT devices are available from multiple vendors. Are we sure though that the only attack vector here is remote code execution? Let me show you two examples of exploiting this vulnerability with uh, the use of two different protocols. EFRCIT is a state-of-the-art networking protocol designed for use in industrial applications, especially those that require real-time operation of the entire system. It is one of the most favored mechanisms used by cyber criminals to transfer data payloads due to its flexible transmission of ECIT, UDP or TCP. In this packet you can see that the porn show script is supposed to be downloaded from another server. Inside the script we could find two executables to be downloaded from a yet another server. We happen to be dealing with uh, MIPS architecture here. In this case, the machine code must be decompiled. The result is the identification of three comments. The first one is used to get information about all listening TCP sockets and all established TCP connections. The second one is used to get information about process IDs. The third one is used to get a list of files using the FD file and directory utility in Unix. It turns out then that the remote code execution vulnerability leads in this case to the information disclosure attack vector. This slide confirms that we are dealing with a common ELF executable format and that it's packed with UPX that uses a data compression algorithm called UCL. Cyber criminals very frequently use UPX in such attacks. Next is Manolito. Manolito is a UDP-based peer-to-peer networking protocol for sharing MP3 and AUG Vorbis files. In fact, it is very often used by cyber criminals to quickly transfer 
data payloads. Once again, a born shell script is supposed to be downloaded from another server. Inside the script, we could find many various executables based on different architectures. You can see this on the slide. Once the machine code is decompiled, it turns out that we are dealing with four different DOS attacks and some other attack vectors too, with ellipses and close in square brackets, I mark the omission of a further section of the compiled code that hit further threats. These were all eight examples I wanted to discuss. Now let me give you 20 simple tips on how to be a proficient network traffic analyst performing deep packet inspections. Let me explain what you could need them for. You could 1. Assist the SOC team in carrying out their operations. Understand network traffic by network edge profiling to get to know intent, correctly estimate risk and take appropriate mitigation actions to be able to close an alert with 100% certainly and as a result raise cyber security level in the organization. Get rid of unwanted traffic, the so-called garbage that affects visibility in clips via BGP black holing. 4. Prevent zero-day attacks. Advise using Wireshark and PowerShell. Look for anomalies, typical signs of malignancy, such as malformed packet, this might indicate a false positive or a crafted packet, ACK or PSH ACK flux set in a TCP packet, this could be a crafted packet over TCP as much as a false positive, unknown opcode, non standard operation. Empty frame, the goal is to transport the payload. Payload indicating a different protocol than the one currently used. And Centura. Look at the signature in pickup files via the select string comment. The comment uses regular expression matching the to search for text patterns in input strings and files. On this slide you can see one example with uh, MGL and DD string we discussed earlier. You can write your own script then with many comments and perform many signatures to search in network traffic dumps, but keep in mind the execution policy in PowerShell. It needs to be set to unrestricted. You can also write scripts using Wireshark and or T Shark through the command line interface. But be sure to add Wireshark to your environment variables. Use functionality ignore and ignore packets to get rid of packets that are not your point of interest and then focus on the ones that are important. Use functionality create a column from a field to be able to search and sort a network dump using a very specific piece of information that might be a malicious indicator. In this example, we can see monlist, which is a debugging comment that allows to retrieve information from the monitoring facility about traffic associated with the NTP service. This comment is used for DOS attacks below version 4.2.7. Use display filters, for example the one visible on the slide, to end up with the same result as in advice number 6. Add and apply permanent display filters to be able to search for very specific information in a network dump just with one click. Use the follow TCP stream functionality or others if you want to see the whole network communication 
and stream within which there was one packet that you were initially interested in. Use the export package presentation as CSV functionality to be able to filter data from a network dump easier and faster within Excel and not within Wireshark. In this example, apart from the already mentioned monlist comment, request code number 32, request underscore key, indicates an HTTP get float attack using the NTP protocol only as a mechanism to carry the data payload. Use the hierarchy of protocols functionality under the statistics tab if you want to focus only on communication related to just one protocol. Additional advice. Larry understands standard traffic. Define the so-called baselining. You can find some samples of network dumps in the internet, so investigate them and learn how standard traffic looks and what it does. For example, in the slide, you can see the previously mentioned Edwin protocol, both the standard and non-standard traffic focus on the differences. Learn and understand what kind of network traffic exploits generate. That is, how it differs from standard traffic, thus baselining. Fire away some exploit in Kali Linux, sniff traffic, and then generate uh, that they generate, and then investigate it. Learn about traffic generated by services that collect and analyze data on malicious internet activity such as Shadow Server, Shodan, Rapid7, etc. I perceive such network traffic as benign through positives. On this slide we can see ENRP protocol that is used by the reliable server pooling framework for the communication between pool registrars to maintain and synchronize a handle space. The ENRP presence message type aims to take control of poor registrar server by continuously announcing its presence. Here the attacker is not interested in information about the server, which in turn would indicate a different attack vector because of the flag used. The information of what flag was set completely changes the type of attack vector that is the intention of a cyber criminal generating such traffic. Performing DPI analysis, it can be observed that other popular protocols such as HTTP for example, by exploiting vulnerabilities against the web against the web-based outlook OWI of the RC type that is remote code execution leading to unauthorized bypass, but also little known protocols such as we already mentioned GTP, but also IAPP or the 802.11 standard to take control of devices providing hosts with access to a computer network via wireless transmission medium such as radio waves or Cisco Auto RP to take over all traffic that reaches any number of recipients and configurations for each router. Learn about the traffic generated by vulnerability scanners such as Nessus. Use IP tables to block known malicious hexadecimal strings, hex strings. Based on the previously mentioned MGLNDD string, we can configure the IP packet filter rules in such a way that a firewall will not send RTT values to the attacker, depriving him or her of control over a DOS attack using RIPE Atlas tool. In the example seen in the slide, it is actually recommended not only to block certain hex strings for certain services like the previously mentioned FTP, but for all services. Read, read and read some more. RFCs, so a collection of technical documents, memorandum, especially the entire scope of operability like the DNS one shown in the slide in the middle, plus documentations from vendors. Make notes of your DPI analysis so that you don't have to perform the same analysis several times.
Over the last five years and a half, I have been analyzing network traffic and writing my own encyclopedia. But at this very point, is over 6,500 pages long and includes almost 2,000 attacks based on DPI that are not known mostly in the internet. This is this documentation. I'm showing you a very, very short part of it because it's not publicly available anywhere at this point it's my secret source of knowledge that contains all the findings of all the DPI analysis I have conducted in my career I will most likely publish it in the future as a book of my own creation. If we scroll down to the very bottom, yeah, I will see it's almost 6,600 pages long. Okay, getting back to the presentation, because that's what we should be doing at this point. Let's move to the next advice. In correlation with performing network edge profiling, get to know the so-called baseline, get to know the infrastructure, vast systems and devices along the supported protocols that can communicate with them, and analyze policies on the firewall. A large part of the network traffic monitoring and handling of potential incidents can be reduced by the so-called hardening reconfiguration. However, don't forget techniques such as pivoting and relaying. These are techniques used to route traffic from an attacked computer to other networks that are not accessible to the hacker's machine, for example by creating an encrypted layer 2 tunnel of USI model. As we well know, not every single service is directly exposed to the world publicly. Practice makes perfect. Regular profiling of the infrastructure network edge combined with network traffic analysis, vast DPI, consequently learning hundreds of protocols, thousands of network operations, exploits, signatures, etc we raise your awareness, which would translate into a situation where risk is correctly assessed for each potential incident and each alert is correctly addressed with a correct operational decision. Don't make decisions based on assumptions, don't take risks and be sure you know what you're doing because it's up to you whether someone unauthorized gets into your infrastructure. Although Sometimes there are tons of things to check. In this slide we can see a long packet full of many headers and values. In this packet, in short, we have a procedure for activating the PDP context by using the already mentioned GTP protocol. The goal will be to activate the direct tunnel to be able to send user data. And sometimes it is quite complicated. The five items marked in red in this packet point to key information for understanding the attack. IEC 60870 in Electrical Engineering Power System Automation, the International Electrotechnical Commission 60870 standards define systems used for telecontrol supervisory control and data acquisition. Such systems are used for controlling electric power transmission grids and other geographically widespread control systems. IEC 60870 Part 5, known as Transmission Protocols, provides a communication profile for sending basic telecontrol messages between two systems which uses permanent directly connected data circuits between the systems. In this case, we are dealing with 
ASDU process information monitor direction information disclosure attempt. This can be deduced from 1. The value number 3 for the spontaneous cause of transmission. 2. The value false for the use of ASDU not sent for testing purposes. 3. The fact that the ASDU address is used to address a specific station. And 4. The fact that the address of the initiator, that is the master, is not included in the message sent to the recipient, that is the slave, and is disabled in the configuration. The functionalities are so broad that the same mechanism can be used among other things too. 1. Check for the status of established connection, thus test an open connection, for example to control the data transfer. 2. Perform a control frame test to ensure the frame can be received by the RTU, for example to start a data transfer control as the next step in the kill chain or free acquire information about all values for all information objects to classify the data which then in the next stage of the kill chain can result in the change in the configuration for example during the generation of electricity of a power generator to probably just increase or decrease it the consequences could be catastrophic This is everything I wanted to discuss during this presentation lecture. I could spend literally months to show and explain you more, but I had very limited time. Plus, I did not want to be too boring. There is literally a never-ending story to show. Once again, you can contact me via email at mikewithpolandgmail.com or LinkedIn. Just type in Michal Soltisic. Thank you for watching, remember to leave your questions and rate the presentation in the comments section below. Goodbye.